In the Chinese epic fantasy drama, Ashes of Love, a character is revealed to have been the bastard son of a king who is an immortal dragon. As a little boy, he was picked on because the horns on his head he inherited from his father made him weird and different. His mother, not wanting the father to find him, took a knife to the horns, but they would always grow back. So eventually, the little boy would cut off his own horns every time they grew back. This act, shoving away his darkness every time it would creep up, is a story we've seen before. This story is one that represents how children, and specifically little boys, work through strong emotions, especially anger. Get off now! I'll eat you up! What is wrong with you? This is not acceptable behavior! You're not acceptable! Psychologically, it could illustrate how all little boys are treated as little monsters who have the potential to become the worst of humanity. And telling this story could help us work through what that means for young men, and how they can persevere. Luke's just not a farmer, Owen. He has too much of his father in him. That's what I'm afraid of. But conquering or defeating this thing is not usually how it works out. Don't choose, Jack. Don't decide. You don't want to be a hero. You don't want to try and save everyone. Because... When you fail, you just don't have what it takes. Simply stating that someone has darkness inside of them is not the only thing that is significant about this type of story. It's significant in these stories because it's being represented in a way which takes on a sort of being all on its own. It becomes a shadow, a force, a power, a visual darkness or maybe a flickering light and vein of darkness that a mother feels inside of her womb, such as with Ben Solo. The other characters in the story can see it or are intimately associated with it. You're a monster. Yes, I am. It's also something the character was born with. They didn't just become a monster. They always were. This is all about the transition from adolescence into adulthood. Kylo is that anger of adolescence. So what do they do about it? What's the point of telling the story in this manner? When asked if he had read Joseph Campbell in preparation for writing episode 8, Ryan Johnson responded, No, but I reread some Young and listened to a bunch of Robert Bly lectures. Close. Yes, Ryan, this is pretty darn close. Because like Campbell, who also drew off of Jungian ideas, Robert Bly believed that finding your true self requires exploring your shadow or your dark side. Bly explains in A Little Book on the Human Shadow how projecting can help someone reclaim their shadow. Projecting is when the human ego defends itself against unconscious impulses or qualities by denying those qualities in themselves while attributing them to others. Projecting is often seen by Jungians to be a negative thing only. What's wrong with you? No, what's wrong with you? No, what's wrong with you? You're projecting. Drop it. You drop it. You stop projecting on me. But Bly saw a sort of ironic but charming use for it. For example, when parents react in anger instead of grief and tell their children not to act a certain way, not to express their anger, it inadvertently makes the child put that part of their shadow away, or in some cases, project onto the parent. So little boys may put away the pure natural side of themselves, their wildness or wickedness. And according to Bly, their mother will take on that projection until they are married, transferring that wickedness onto the wife. In comparing this to the Force, dark side users draw upon raw emotions such as anger, hate, and passion. We could probably also call the act of doing so wickedness. So in teaching this via myth or story, by projecting our shadow, we've already begun the process of retrieving it, and therefore becoming closer to knowing our true selves. Where the Wild Things Are, by Maurice Sendak, is a story of a young boy who dresses up as a wolf, wreaks havoc on his household, and is therefore sent to bed without supper. 
Through his imagination, he escapes into the world of wild beasts who make him the king of beasts. After these shenanigans in his imaginary world, Max returns to reality, only to find a hot meal waiting for him. Because of the controversial nature and storytelling style, this book was banned from many libraries and it took a while for critics to warm up to it. Even so, some critics valued the themes that truly resonated with children. One critic suggested that the book has an entirely deliberate and beautiful use of the psychoanalytic story of anger. Max has a tantrum and in a flight of fancy visits his wild side, but he is pulled back by a belief in parental love to a supper still hot balancing the seesaw of fear and comfort. Selma G. Lanes discussed how the book, alongside two other of Sindak's works, revolved around the same theme, how children master various feelings, danger, boredom, fear, frustration, jealousy, and managed to come to grips with the realities of their lives. Sindak had three books that acted as a sort of trilogy based on psychological development. In the Night Kitchen, Toddler, Where the Wild Things Are, preschool, and Outside Over There, pre-adolescent. Side note, Outside Over There at least partially inspired Henson's Labyrinth. There are many other stories you've probably consumed that have this similar framework. The following are examples of the myth of what I like to call the little boy with the horns on his head. They all have variations of popular tropes, but essentially they all deal with one, the inability of the male to process his childhood or adolescent anger, two, the acceptance of themselves being a monster, and three, a consistent struggle with the parent or parental figure that they project on. In a transformative retelling of Hades and Persephone, the very popular webtoon Lore Olympus explores Hades' fear of his father. In both legend and in this version, Hades was swallowed by his father Kronos because of a prophecy that stated that one of his sons would kill him. Although he was regurgitated and the children locked Kronos away in Tartarus, the webtoon allows this to explain Hades' shadow, the darkness that he will always carry with him. Hades as a boy was painted as innocent by his mother, but as a potential bringer of death by his father. Hades forever carried this trauma with him along with the idea that he could also turn into a true monster that is his own father. Naruto is not told about the nine-tailed beast that is literally locked inside of him until he's 12. He spends much of his childhood not understanding why the other kids are afraid of him, why they won't play with him. Throughout the course of his heroic journey, he continues to be a host of this monster and eventually finds out how to control it. A great example of this theme is Loki in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, who was born to a people considered monsters by the ones who took him in. What? Because I, I, I'm a monster that parents tell their children about at night? No. You know, I don't... In Sensei, Wolfgang takes on his father's legacy even though he hated him. My father was a monster. And so are you, and so am I. Siler in Heroes desperately wanted to please his overbearing mother who wanted him to be more than just what his father was. Maybe I don't have to be special. Can't you just tell me that's enough? Why would I tell you that when I know you could be so much more? When he finally becomes a monster, he is happy to be one because at least then he is finally more than what his father was. Although Siler is the show's main antagonist throughout most of its run, he eventually does find redemption. I'm here to save her. That's not you. I'm a hero. Ben's story so far matches all of these. Ben's relationship with his father was strained, yes, but the real correlation is to his grandfather. Too much Vader. That's why I wanted him to train with Luke. Leia sent Ben away to Luke to protect him from becoming like Vader. That's why I lost you both. Let's look at a different kind of story. One in which the adolescent is given the hand he needs to deal with his newfound shadow. A new Korean pop group called Tomorrow by Together, or TXT, debuted this year with a song, Crown. It's about a little boy who one day looks in the mirror only to find that he's grown horns on his head. Fearing he's become a monster, he runs away. 
but then he finds a different boy who has grown wings on his back. A potential reference to BTS, who are older and act as mentors to TXT under their music agency. The lyrics then become brighter. The song is about integrating your shadow, talking about your shadow when it is first exposed to you. It's a commentary on how little boys are treated as little monsters because of what they have the potential to become, especially once they hit puberty. But in this story, the boys find a way to own that darkness as soon as it arises. In all of these stories, the potential monster inside changes throughout the journey of the hero. In many cases, it's revealed not to be a monster at all, but instead a raw power that they can get to know and that can be controlled. These stories can help to teach children how to embrace their emotions and come to understand why they feel the way they do without acting on those negative emotions. For adults, it reminds us that we may still have unprocessed garbage we tucked away in our childhood that we must project, receive, and consume in order to piece our true selves back together. Ironically, we most often see these initial traits and characteristics in our villains. But when told with this framework, with sympathy and understanding, in fact, it goes beyond sympathy. It's more intimate than that. It then would only make sense to provide that individual a redemption in order to complete their arc. Eat your shadow. In a little book on the human shadow, Bly outlines three ways to honor negative emotions such as anger instead of acting out on it. One. Capture sympathetic anger when listening to someone else speak about something that makes you angry, some trauma they experienced. Capture it and express it in conversation. I don't understand. No, your parents threw you away like garbage. They didn't. They did. Two, regard your anger as a person and ask of it what it wants of you. Three, bring your anger out into the light and don't be ashamed of it. Don't make deals with your anger under the table and shove it back into the darkness when you've gotten what you need from it. Form relationships, get to know your darkness, and talk about it with the people who are close to you. So now that we know how to retrieve that darkness, how do we complete the story? Bring it full circle for a happy ending, incorporate the feminine, and find love. Get there in the end, oh yes. Doctor? How do sharks make babies? Carefully. Birds do it, bees do it, even educated fleas do it. Every lonely monster needs a companion. It's the oldest story in the universe. This one, or any other, boy and girl fall in love, get separated by events, war, politics, accidents and time. She's thrown out of the hex, or he's thrown into it. Since then, they've been yearning for each other across time and space, across dimensions. This isn't a ghost story, it's a love story. Hades finds his Persephone and has a therapist. Loki recognizes Thor as his true family. Siler's greatest enemy becomes his greatest friend. Wolfgang falls in love. To complete his arc, Ben Solo must find a way to reintegrate or eat his shadow. And although he'll definitely find his way to redemption on his own, his companion will be there waiting for him on the other side of that dark abyss to help him atone and heal. Thanks everyone for watching. Uh, Please like and subscribe. Don't forget to let me know what you think in the comments, unless you're mean. Please don't be mean. Um, And uh, cheers!